please join me in welcoming Dr. Elena Katapan as the third John Mars Elector. Dr. Katapan. Hi, thanks so much for coming. It's an honor to be here and also an honor to be part of this lecture series. I recently moved back to Ontario after six years away and this lecture is a real homecoming of sorts and everybody knows there's nowhere better to do a homecoming than Queens. <laughs> and what I'm discussing today is something that's motivated my work and activism for a long time, but it's not something that I've spoken about. Most of my research, as you heard a minute ago, is about the politics of reproduction and about the governance of the body. But I've been engaged in activism around women, gender, and violence for much of my life, and so this is a welcome home in more ways than one. So we'll begin. So this is a story that many of you will know well. On the evening of December 6, 1989, just as classes for the semester were coming to a close, a man walked into L'Ecole Polytechnique, which is the engineering school at the University of Montreal, and he walked in with a rifle. He entered a classroom and forced the men to leave. After shooting the nine women that remained, he proceeded to walk the hallways, eventually killing 14 and wounding several more before killing himself. The gunman clearly stated, both at the time of the shooting and in a letter found on his person, that his motive for engaging in this violence was revenge on the so-called feminists that had ruined his life. He also had with him a list uh, that included the names of prominent Quebecois feminists that he would have killed if he had time. I was a child when the shooting occurred, um, but it was a formative moment for me, as it is for many Canadian feminists. I remember it extremely clearly. I remember seeing my mother and watching her watch the news. And on the news, there were people huddling together in the street outside the school, the flashing lights of ambulances and street lamps reflecting off the snow. And the image here is low contrast because it's a still from the television show that I was watching at the time. It's from coverage from that night and of what I remember seeing. Nearly 29 years later, a man drove down Young Street on a Monday afternoon, jumping the curb and aiming to hit as many pedestrians as possible. The media around that attack focused largely on the perpetrator's experiences as a so-called incel, a term that refers to a person who is involuntarily celibate, expressing his disdain for women as a group who seemingly deprived him of sex. And the victims of the attack were largely women, eight of 10, and in the post-attack interview made public last month, the perpetrator admitted that this, this radicalized, violent misogyny, was the reason that he was seeking retribution. I'm not the first person to speak about or write about these things together. The attack in Toronto resulted in the largest death toll of a mass act of violence since the Montreal massacre. And together with the gendered nature of the act, there has been at least some comparisons, including feminist analyses. In one of these articles, Anne Terrio, who is one of Canada's most compelling feminist journalists right now, wrote that in both cases, the perpetrators were engaged in, quote, violence against women, asserting themselves as equal in public and private realms. Violence against women, yes, but violence especially against women who dare step out of place. So the Montreal massacre and the attack in Toronto are two examples, but there are many more. And I should mention too that I'm not just talking about the violence that women experience, but also the threats of violence and the threats that follow women who speak out against misogyny. So the death and rape threats that followed media critic Anita Sarkeesian when she spoke out about misogyny in video games. Former environment minister Catherine McKenna has not only received threats online, but in real life too, as people shout gendered slurs at her as she drives from their cars or paint offensive graffiti on her campaign office. And it wasn't that long ago that Nora Laredo, uh, who is a journalist, dared question the response to the tragic deaths of members of the Humboldt Broncos hockey team, resulting in her in receiving thousands of harassing and threatening messages online. And these threats are violent and graphic in nature. I started to put together a PowerPoint slide for you that included some of these threats, but I was blurring so many F words and C words and triggering language about bodies and what would be done to them that I stopped. The history of angry women speaking out about injustice is at least as long as the list of threats that they receive. So anger has been having a moment. 
There's been a groundswell in the last few years of scholarship and commentary about who gets to be angry and how. Numerous books and reviews have been published on women's anger and the right to take up space, and at the same time, others are published on the rise of hate and anger amongst those feeling alienated from society and who are outraged as a result. But the scholarship on anger, gender, and violence that I've been encountering really considers these two kinds of anger separately. The anger is really divided. The texts tend to address one or the other. So on the one hand, there's violent, radicalized misogyny, and then on the other hand, there's this need for women to take up space, to get angry, to speak louder, to be louder. But they're so closely related. Whenever women speak up and out, or to take up space that they haven't before, when they behave as, quote, nasty women do, violent actions and threats are there to hold us back, to ask us to question these advances. And there's a direct relationship between the anger of violent men in particular and women's own ambition. And I'm angry myself that women have to continue to dedicate their lives to scratch and claw and fight for recognition of the legitimacy of their existence. This is a lecture series about controversies. And what I'm saying here continues to be controversial, although it shouldn't be. It is dangerous to be a woman in Canada and elsewhere in the world, and even more dangerous to be a woman of color, a disabled woman, a poor woman, a trans woman, or an indigenous woman. Although the status of women in Canada has certainly improved in the decades since the Montreal massacre, real and threatened violence pervade the experiences of those that would take up spaces and sites of power that they haven't historically occupied. So the point I'm making today is that we can't understand the rise of women's rights and anger that fuels feminist mobilization for social justice without understanding its relationship to the gendered anger that seeks to curb women's progress. It is an endless cycle of outrage in which feminists rail against misogyny while misogynists rail against feminists. In the short time that we have together, I'm not going to offer a unifying theory of anger and, and I don't have any real solutions, but I bring with me reflections on this simple emotion that has incredibly complex consequences. This isn't the primary site of my research, as I said before, but it's the site of my longstanding activism, and I thank you for listening as I speak instead about this issue that's compelled me to be a feminist scholar in the first place. I want to speak about the exquisite danger of being a woman who is angry and who steps out of place and the consequences of that anger. I want to consider when and why we're willing to call certain acts gendered violence and when gendered anger is dismissed and where that all takes us 30 years after a gunman entered L'Ecole Polytechnique. So anger is not always violent, and violence isn't always done in anger, but there is a relationship between these two issues and a relationship that's highly gendered, highly racialized, and otherwise bound up in power relations of the status quo. So we'll begin, really, by thinking about anger. You know what anger is. We know it inherently. But it's often defined, at least in philosophy, as an emotion that follows when someone has deliberately wronged us. Intentionality, I think, is important here. And although we might have frustration or stress when an accident happens, anger is typically associated with really willful wrongdoing, a result of somebody else's conscientious decision to do us harm. Studies on the psychology of anger understand it as an emotion that stems from something else, fear or shame or hate, with strong physiological implications. Bear with me here. As you become angry about something, your muscles get tense. And there's neurotransmitters that release into the bloodstream, which give you this burst of energy. Your heart beats faster, your blood rushes to your face and your extremities. Anger is described as a hot feeling. And like, you know, you know what it feels like. Blood rushes to your face. You literally get hotter, ready to spring into action. The metaphors of anger reflect this. Our blood boils, we're burning with rage. And when we understand anger in these terms, all forms of anger are the same. The perceived intentional wrongdoing occurs and we roll it over our, in our mind as our blood pressure mounts. But anger is a diverse population of experiences and behaviors and it manifests differently in different people. And what comprises anger varies widely, including diversity by language and culture. Russian, for example, distinguishes between individually felt anger and something that's more abstract, something more political. And ancient Greeks distinguished between the slow-burning anger of grudges and the rapid, hot, intense bursts of rage. 
In the contemporary study of anger, violence, and gender and politics, anger seems to be generally subdivided into two messy categories that are loosely characterized by the source of the outrage. And it's a major oversimplification here, but what I'm gonna call them is the good anger and the troublesome anger. On the one hand, there's a kind of good anger, most often associated with witnessing or experiencing legitimate wrongdoing, and that anger motivates us to defend ourselves and others, to prioritize the problem at hand, to find solutions. The good anger is the kind that's generally associated with the civil rights movement, the riots at Stonewall, and so many other movements and protests that have worked to challenge injustice. It can involve violence, but isn't prone to it. It's been described as the fuel that fires creativity or helps us write treatises that inspire. It is consciousness raising, and it gives us the motivation to focus in on and articulate what needs to be taken seriously, to find ways to be heard when it seems that no one will listen. So feminist scholars and activists of color have long been teaching us about the utility of this anger. I need to draw here on Audre Lorde's uses of anger and her recognition of anger as not only legitimate, but necessary for social justice. Lorde famously writes that every woman has a well-stocked arsenal of anger potentially useful against those oppressions, personal and institutional, that brought anger into being. And focused with precision, it can become a powerful source of energy that serves progress and change. Anger is a productive force when it enables groups experiencing marginalization to build solidarity and to contest the institutions that keep them out of power. This anger has been called virtuous. But the good form of anger, broadly conceived, must be contrasted with its more troublesome counterpart. This anger is destructive and illegitimate, that which is most associated with hate, with violence, with aggression. It's seen to be unjust rage, and it's anger that instead of binding us together can tear us apart. So this more troublesome form of anger is not about rectifying injustice through productive means, but rather addressing perceived wrongdoing through retribution. This anger is at once slow burning and explosive and has clear targets, the sources of the anger who might pay for what they've done. This kind of anger is theorized not as turning towards a just future, it's about maintaining the power of the present. This anger is imbued with hatred as those who feel this sort of anger may be aggrieved that the lives that they've known are changing or the circumstances that they feel entitled to are no more. So there's some obvious problems with this dualism that I see in the literature. For one, it's challenging to distinguish between good and troublesome anger without a common understanding of justice. This distinction between good moral outrage and that benefits social justice and troublesome anger fails to acknowledge that even those who have illegitimate or unjust reasons for their anger still feel wronged. They still feel as if somebody has willfully harmed them. Their anger is valid, even if it is misplaced. Further, there are instances in which the cause of anger is entirely legitimate and rational, but the actions that follow are violent, are vicious, are retributive. So another problem is that all anger might be troublesome. In her Anger and Forgiveness, Resentment, Generosity, Justice, political theorist Martha Nussbaum takes up the tradition of the Stoics, suggesting that all anger is ultimately about payback and that anger demands of us to do wrong to those who have wronged us, that they should suffer as we have suffered. She writes to this end that perhaps if you, if you don't want some kind of payback, your emotion is something else, grief maybe, but not really anger. And payback, she thinks, doesn't get us very far. Although anger might help us mobilize in the first place or enable solidarity, it's when we forego our desire for anger, when we forego our need for payback to transcend anger that we're able to make the change that the first good kind of anger is perceived to enable. Perhaps it's not anger, Nussbaum suggests, that gets us to our goals, but rather forgiveness and empathy after that anger subsides. And while I find Nussbaum convincing in many ways, the goal of the retribution might be to take power from the powerful, to get payback in ways that are useful to the way that Audre Lorde conceives them. And we're entitled to feel that anger. Anger articulated loudly in the face of injustice is disruptive and a necessary force, and it gives groups that are marginalized the space and capacity to address the limits imposed on their lives. And when we speak only of love, of forgiveness, of empathy, we also risk erasing differences between and within claims-making groups. If we speak only of love in the women's movement, for example, we risk erasing those who've been marginalized within it. Anger enables long-silenced voices to make themselves heard. So if anger is, as I said before, having a moment, 
In the numerous texts about the rise of the right and the need for women's anger, although they are messy and problematic, it is these two forms of anger that I see. And we see this dichotomy of either or, sort of good, sort of bad. And I see them too into mapping onto the ways that the Montreal massacre and other mass acts of violence have been memorialized and discussed. So each year as commentators reflect on the contemporary meaning of the tragedy, we see these angers infused in the texts. And so together we'll consider them in turn. First, the troublesome anger of the gunmen. Secondly, the seemingly good anger of feminists targeted for speaking out in their public and private lives. And then we'll consider the persistent backlash that brings these angers together. So there's much debate about whether or not to name perpetrators of mass violence, as naming them not only individualizes their actions, but also may contribute to the notoriety that some have expressed that they desire. I won't name names. But I will say a few things about the gunman in Montreal. He was rejected from the Canadian forces at a time when women were actively and publicly fighting for inclusion and struggled to complete courses to advance his education. He was rejected twice from L'Ecole Polytechnique and attributed his actions to a need to kill feminists. He wanted to kill them for their opportunism and for wanting to, and these are his words now, keep the advantages of women, for example, cheaper insurance, extended maternity leave, preceded by preventative leave, etc., while seizing for themselves those of men. Quebecois journalist Francine Pelletier, who was on the gunman's list of prominent women, he would have killed with more time, agreed to meet with a man after the massacre. A man who called her at home and said, if you want to interview the gunman after his death, interview me instead. And in their meeting, he described how men's anxieties and frustrations had bubbled over into violence. The shooting in Montreal, this man said, was because the gunman was frustrated. Frustrated with the space being taken up by women, frustrated with his experiences with women, and frustrated by women keeping him away from that which, with which he was entitled angry for a life that he just couldn't seem to live. Contemporary anger politics and the mobilization of disaffected men and particularly disaffected white men comes out of a sense of injustice too. A sense that there were promises of something that they could never have and a sense of entitlement to a world that no longer exists. For those who are always told that they could be whatever they wanted, that there were no limits to their power, it's jarring, I imagine, to be told no for the first time in history. And this is, in some ways, a troublesome anger. We would hesitate to articulate that a willful wrong has been done to this group, yet it feels like that wrong has occurred, and it's often interpreted as willful. In the inaugural Meisel lecture two years ago, Deborah Thompson spoke about the rise of hate in the United States by referencing Arlie Hochschild's Strangers in Their Own Land, a book which works to explain the reemergence, and some would say the rise, of, right, of right-wing politics. Hostiles uses a metaphor that resonates widely, and Dr. Thompson used it too. The metaphor is this. Imagine a line in which people are standing in the hot sun and waiting for their turn at the good life, which is just over a hill, it's just off in the distance. They've been standing in that line a long time, and they've worked hard to get where they are. But those in the line, those who have been waiting, see those from designated groups, groups with access to social assistance and employment equity, specialized scholarships, they see them stepping ahead. The sense of fairness that those standing in line seem to feel is, of course, based on a false premise that the line was ever fair. Indigenous people, women, people of color, and those who occupy other often overlapping and intersecting identities know that some of those people were never allowed to move forward when they were e even allowed to join the line at all. And to exhaust Hostile's metaphor, it's easy to understand how those who thought the system was generally fair feel betrayed, and they feel hard done by, as from their view, others cut in line. Hochschild mentions gender, but it's really in others' work that we see how gender operates uh, in this context, and particularly how the social construction of masculinity works to validate anger, and with it, violence, as a means to address frustration about that line cutting. The expectations of conventional masculinity are crushing, it needs to be said, and feminist, uh, or the expectations of conventional femininity are crushing too, but in the case of masculinity, they put an inordinate amount of pressure and expectation on men to suppress their emotions, to maintain an outward appearance of hardness and dominance, and to engage in violence to counter any perception of potential vulnerability. The need to maintain this appearance is what has come to be called toxic masculinity, and many seek to keep up with it, 
as their dominance in power in society is slowly eroded. Feminist critic and journalist Jessica Valenti writes that the vulnerability of contemporary society and the shifting place of men within it has resulted in men transferring vulnerable feelings to feelings of anger. Being vulnerable is the historic enemy of masculinity. And it's not just that women are taking up more space in public life than they have before. It is that those men who are angry about it and unable to cede power believe that on some level, implicitly or explicitly, women are not entitled to that power the way that they are. Power can be shared, but when one group has been occupying nearly all of it for so long, they're necessarily those who will not get what they thought that they deserved, unless they continue to deprive others of the same. Women's progress is therefore perceived as a threat. And to be clear, it is a threat. It's a threat to men's domination, men's power, and systems that have kept us and others out for far too long. In the wake of the Montreal massacre, feminists sought to understand the motives of the gunmen in relation to this broader social context, and particularly women's steadily rising economic and social status. In a 1990 article for Rebel Girls Rag, author Mary Gelatly tried to put the massacre into context, thinking through the social conditions that would lead the gunmen down the path. She wrote, rising unemployment, plant closures, cutbacks in social programs, etc., all produce a context of despair and alienating conditions in which violence, as legitimated by state and cultural representations, become perceived as one of the solutions for the individual. These conditions create the vulnerability that leave men looking for an outlet for their anger and a place through which to counter their vulnerability by exerting dominance. Gelatly's words could have been written yesterday. So there's another way to understand gendered anger in relation to the Montreal massacre. And it's through its occurrence at a time when feminists in Canada were organizing effectively and really raging against conditions of injustice. The mid to late 1980s marked the continuation of several decades of a strong women's movement in Canada with new advances, including the institution of employment equity, the first woman leader of a federal political party, and the decriminalization of abortion. The good mobilizing rage was in full force as thousands took to the streets, including the streets of Montreal in 1989, to protest the Quebec Court of Appeals decision to uphold an injunction preventing a woman, her name was Chantal Daigle, from getting an abortion. The injunction had been filed by her violent ex-partner. And the image you're seeing is of the day of action on abortion in October 1989 that mobilized women in light of the Daigle case and also a proposed law, also mobilizing against this proposed law that would recriminalize abortion a year after its decriminalization. And so while the Supreme Court overturned the Daigle decision and the new abortion law did not go through, feminists in 1989 were mad as hell. And what incited women to take to the streets then as now in tremendous numbers was concern that if they didn't, things would get worse. There was a feeling, frustration, and outrage that decades of work around abortion access would be lost. And then, as now, there was frustration with political leadership about the possibility of a less bright future that brought women out and brought them out in droves. So I've said it already that anger's been having a moment, but nowhere is that more readily available, or, or can we see it, than in the essays and books that have been written about women's rage in the last three years. One of the books, one of the most widely read, it's called Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Women's Anger. And in it, writer and media critic Soraya Chamali examines how women have long been taught to suppress their rage, to suppress their rage about discrimination, about violence, and the exhaustion that accompanies a daily fight against misogyny. Another example is Rebecca Traister's Good and Mad, which takes a historical perspective tracing angry women's contributions over time. Writing in the wake of Hillary Clinton's portrayal as a, quote, nasty woman, the subtext of Traister's book is that angry women have always gotten things done. These books tell a truth that feels like something we've always known, and that is that women are socialized to be passive and to stay quiet, to compromise, to stand aside, and to not get angry. And those, for those that dare speak up and express their anger, they risk being construed in unflattering ways that may un impede on the social and personal and professional lives that they want. Yet Traister calls us to take a moment and to look back at those who came before and to know that often voicing our anger, while difficult and costly, it's worked. For some people, though, the costs of anger are higher than for others. 
The trope of the angry black woman is important here as it's black feminists and scholars who've always been, still are at the forefront of theorizing on the complexity of anger in political and social life. Brittany Cooper's memoir, Eloquent Rage, is a new book that considers anxieties about how to negotiate feminist politics that are often exclusionary and racial politics that don't take misogyny seriously. Cooper, like Audre Lorde, shows us the importance of rage when intersectional understandings of injustice are often still few and far between. So as we call for women to be angry and to engage in the kind of good anger that makes social change, Cooper draws our attention to point out the different costs for different people. Feminist theorist Sarah Ahmed uses the figure of the feminist killjoy instead as a way to describe the cost of anger and how it weighs on our everyday lives. Her metaphor isn't a line like cost child's, instead it's a kitchen table. She says there's a table around which a family sits and around which somebody invariably um, says something problematic. You might have experienced this at Thanksgiving or another time. So you speak up, upsetting the dinner, and you alienate yourselves from the others around the table. You become the problem. Instead of the likely offensive views, you are the problem because you wouldn't let things lie. You couldn't just be quiet. For those that need the others around the table or who are already precarious or who are invested in those relationships, speaking out against the problematic statement might just be too difficult and too costly. So when we ask women to embrace their anger and to mobilize for social justice or even for change in their daily lives, we might be asking a lot. We might be asking for more than we know because it is, as I've already established, extremely dangerous to be an angry woman and some are not able or willing to engage. And the figure of the feminist killjoy, I think, lets us understand how social justice work is a matter of being difficult, but it's difficult to be difficult. It's necessary and important and a place that solidarity is found, but it's always a risk to be the one that gets in the way. So the days and weeks that followed the massacre brought with them a struggle over how to make sense of the tragedy. In Montreal, the gunman explicitly targeted women and he explicitly stated that he wanted feminists to die. Yet many of you will know that the coverage of the tragedy did not initially focus on the gendered nature of the crime, and certainly not on its misogynistic underpinnings. Among the notorious of this coverage comes from the late Barbara Frum, who challenged the idea in an interview that the massacre had anything to do with violence against women, stating that, quote, why do we diminish the monstrosity of the violence by suggesting that it was an act against just one group. It was the efforts of feminist activists, journalists, and commentators that worked to ensure that the massacre thereafter was understood in terms of violence against women and as a manifestation of misogyny. But the initial failure to recognize the Montreal massacre as an act of violence against women, that is, as a hate crime, is territory well trod. This issue was is highlighted time and again to identify the ways that public memory matters. We know now that certainly it was an act of misogyny, and we need to continue to name violence as it occurs in order to recognize its pervasiveness and its persistence. But while the Montreal massacre is now remembered this way, it isn't clear that media and commentators have learned from this experience. It's rare to see coverage that addresses the gendered nature of crimes targeting women as misogyny still, and it's been rare in the decades that have passed since the massacre. In research that I conducted more than 10 years ago now, I compared the media coverage of the Montreal massacre with that of the shootings in a place called Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. In that case, a man also walked into a school with a gun. He lined the students up, released all of the male students and a few others. The 10 remaining girls were shot, and of those, five died. The gunman then killed himself. The facts of that case seem strikingly similar to the case of the Montreal massacre, and when I first read about that incident in the newspaper, I was looking carefully for analysis that would address the shooting in relation to what had happened in Montreal. I was looking through Canadian media, and I looked, and I looked, and I bought more papers, but the coverage, which I would study later on, focused almost exclusively on the Amish community in which the shooting happened, and how the community would mourn. And while that was interesting and useful, it was notably absent that there was no mention of gender. So it wasn't until more than a week later that I found an editorial that addressed the target was little girls. Bob Herbert, writing for the New York Times, 
stated that, quote, if the gunman had gone into a school and separated the kids on the basis of race or religion, there would have been outrage. There would have been calls for action and reflection, and the attack would have been seen for what it really was, a hate crime. And none of that occurred because they were just little girls, and we've become so accustomed to living in a society saturated with misogyny that the startling aspect of the Pennsylvania attack was that this terrible thing happened at a school in Amish country, not that it happened to girls. There are other examples. There are so many other examples. There's a 2009 shooting at a gym in Pennsylvania as well, and one at a bank in Florida earlier this year where women were specifically targeted and where the coverage, again, does not address the gendered nature of the crime. But what I'm trying to say here is that the way that sense is made of these events, like the Montreal massacre, like the Toronto van attack, that it matters. And it seems to be about, when we see this coverage, finding ways to say that it's not a matter of pervasive and systematic violence against women, but instead that it's anything else. So that the shooters become divorced of a cultural context that minimizes, objectifies, and invisibilizes women continues. We saw the same thing happen earlier this year when instead of focusing on the content of the report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, coverage focused instead on the use of the term genocide to describe the findings, instead of the findings themselves. It's no surprise, uh, research conducted by Queen's political science PhD candidate, Alicia Corbett, who you'll hear from in a little bit, and others have shown time and again that it's rare when violence against Indigenous women gets called newsworthy or is seen to be violence at all. So the backlash of this sort is not over. Clickbait columnists continue to question the role of, the, of misogyny in the Montreal massacre decades after the fact and to undermine the role of gender in other events of the sort. In 2006, Barbara Kay, writing for the National Post, described the Montreal massacre as, quote, a human tragedy of no inherent political significance and calling it a freak tragedy and an isolated act of violence. In 2009, in a column titled The Montreal Massacre Death Cult, Globe and Mail columnist Margaret Wente wrote that such crimes are often random. And last year, no surprise, she wrote of the Toronto van attack that there is simply nothing to be done and it was, and I'm quoting here, a random act of violence by a homicidal loser. And I don't want to give Kay or Wente a platform here. I, you know, their columns are incendiary by design. But the language used here is gendered, and calling this man a loser and suggesting that those who engage in mass killings are trying to prove that they are real men, this discourse also feeds into the legitimization of toxic masculinity. Whether or not illness and mental illness is part of the story, whether or not there are other ills at play, the turn to violence itself is a matter of gender. It's not a coincidence that mass shooters nearly always have a history of misogyny in their lives and often a history of domestic violence. The shooters may choose different weapons or versions of hate, but the targets were already on our backs. Again, public memory matters, and we need to name violence against women and the hate crimes that misogyny enables as they occur in order to recognize, again, the pervasive and persistence of violence against women. So all is not lost. Uh, feminist scholars and journalists continue to, as they did in 1989, continue to call attention to a public understanding of these events as mass acts of violence against women. Their thoughtful and considered analyses make it clear that these perspectives still exist, yet it continues to be left to feminist commentators to write and speak about the history of violence against women. So 30 years later, they remain far from mainstream. So in a lot of ways, things have changed. The Women's March, the emergence of the Me Too and We Believe Survivors hashtags and the increasing comfort of women in speaking out about injustice seem to be important markers of change. Women were angry then, which helped bring about improvements to the status of women, and we continue to be angry, and hopefully, in spite of those who would attack feminists, attack women, attack anyone, we'll continue to move forward. I promised you no answers. Remember that part? No answers. No unifying theory, but the point is that we stand here 30 years after the Montreal massacre, but we're only 19 months from the Toronto van attack. Women are able to be angrier, perhaps, or angry in new ways, but so too are those who feel entitled to silence us through their violence and their own rage. Then, as now, we're living at a time where there's motivation to change and right historic wrongs, and those that are being asked to cede power or having their privilege curb are angry about it. And perhaps that anger is part of progress. The good anger and its troublesome twin exist together, and neither seems to be going anywhere. 
I, I think this feels maybe like a hopeless conclusion, but I, I don't see it that way. I think that the anger of the privileged is a sign that we're doing something right. And our increasing understanding of toxic masculinity and the tools that new generations of young people are develop, that they're developing to counter it, I think it might mean less violence and less hate. Or at least we are if we're making people more angry, then maybe that's, maybe that's okay. I want to close by reorienting our perspective to the women whose lives were cut short 30 years ago at L'Ecole Polytechnique. I've talked about the anger of the gunmen, of the feminists and commentators who responded, but very little about the victims themselves. So I'll conclude in the tradition of so many feminists who have come before me by reading their names. Jean-Vievre Bergeron, Hélène Colgain, Nathalie Croteau, Barbara Dagnon, and marie Edouard. Maud Havjarnik, Marise Lagenière, Marise Leclerc, Anne-Marie Lemay, Sonia Pelletier, Michel Richard, Annie saint arnaud Annie Turcotte, and Barbara Kluchnik Widautschwitz. May their lives represent all those who go unnamed, and may they continue to inspire our rage. Thank you.